All right, I know you've been taught probably for as long as you've been in science that mass cannot be created or destroyed. That's the law of the conservation of mass. Uh, that's mostly true. It can't be created or destroyed, but it can be converted to other things. And one of those things that it can be converted to is energy. So Einstein's equation, this one right here, you've seen it a lot, I'm sure. It's real popular in cartoons and everywhere else that they talk about Einstein. It's really a simple looking equation and it's a pretty simple concept too. It's revolutionary because of what it showed. So back when they first started looking at nuclear and radiation, things like that, uh, this is back in the early 1900s, they noticed that uh, energy was released by these guys. So, I mean, they would literally take radioactive elements and hold them in their hand and feel the warmth. And so they were trying to figure out, well, where's this energy coming from? What is it that's making these particular rocks, these particular elements, uh, release this heat, release this energy? And so what Einstein came up with is, is he figured out where the energy is coming from, and it's coming from mass that is converted into energy. And in this equation, he was able to calculate, all right, if an element loses this much mass, here's much, how much energy it's going to release. And those two held true, so they matched up perfectly, and that's why this equation is so revolutionary. And they were able to use it for things like nuclear power, nuclear weapons eventually, so they could decipher how much energy we can create. So the way this works is when you combine a proton and a neutron together, they actually shrink down a little bit because they lose mass. And so when they lose mass, it's not being destroyed, it's just being converted into energy. So when they bind together, their mass is decreased and the mass that is lost is converted into energy. And you can figure out how much energy based upon this famous equation. So energy is equal to the mass that's lost times the speed of light squared. So the amount of mass that's lost here is it's a very, very small amount of mass. So you'd think this energy, eh, it's probably not very much. But this number right here, what you're multiplying the mass by, that's the speed of light. So remember, the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th magnitude. So that's 300 million. So you're multiplying the mass that's lost by 300 million. Not only are you multiplying it by 300 million, but it's 300 million squared. What that is, is 9 times 10 to the 16. That is 90 quadrillion. So you are taking the mass that's lost, multiplying it by 90 quadrillion, and that is how much energy is released. So even a small, a tiny, tiny amount of mass can produce a large amount of energy. That's why nuclear explosions and nuclear energy are so powerful, because it's a ton of energy being released from a very, very small amount of matter. Okay, so two words here. Binding energy, which is the energy required to separate a nucleus into its individual nucleons. So if we have a nucleus like this, three protons, three neutrons, the binding energy would be the amount of energy required to separate all of those individual pieces from each other. So pull all six of them completely apart so they feel no force or interaction between them. So when you do this backwards then, so if you were to take those same six uh, nucleons and put them back together, the energy that would be released would be the same, just backwards in magnitude. So the same amount of energy that would be required to pull them apart is the amount of energy that's released when you put them back together. So what goes in goes out. Binding energy per nucleon. So if you want to figure out what the energy is per each individual piece, it would just be the overall binding energy divided by the total number of nucleons. So for this example that we've got up there with the six, you would use the binding energy for the entire nucleon, so this number right there, divided by six. And that would tell you what it is per nucleon. Alright, so there's two types of nuclear energy. There's fusion and fission. So fusion is things fusing together. So if you have two light nuclei, so two smaller nuclei, they're fused together to form a nucleus with an atomic mass that is less than or equal to 56, so fairly small. 56 on the periodic table would be anything below about cesium or barium. So the mass of each nucleon, when they combine, is decreased. We saw that in the first slide. So those protons and neutrons, or protons and protons, come together, and they decrease in mass, and that lost mass is converted to energy. So it's not being destroyed, just converted. And the binding energy per nucleon increases. And with that decrease in binding energy, what that does is kind of requires them to put forth less effort, so they're happier that way. When they're stuck together, they have, don't have to work quite as hard, and so that makes for a more stable element as well. 
So fusion isn't something that we have to force elements to do. We just have to bring them close enough together to where they can fuse, and once they do that, they're actually happier. So here being an example of a fusion reaction, if you have a, a hydrogen proton, okay, so this should be 1-1, one, one. there's no uh, nu neutrons in this, and then you mix it with a 2-1 hydrogen, so this is heavy hydrogen, which is, has one neutron. This is not the most common version, this is the more common version of hydrogen, just a proton, no neutrons, and there'd be an electron out there. And this right here is deuterium, deuterium, that's hydrogen with a mass of 2. So when those two combine, they form a helium atom, because now we have two protons and a neutron. When that happens, the protons and the neutrons all lose a little bit of mass. That mass is converted into energy. Uh, these three versions of hydrogen, or these two versions of hydrogen, this is protium, this is deuterium. You can also have really heavy hydrogen, which is 3,1-H, and that's tritium. And so this guy would have two neutrons and one proton. So when those two combine, they release that uh, energy in the form of mass. This type of reaction right here, this hydrogen fusion, is what happens on the sun. So those combine, it releases a large amount of energy. And if you think of the energy that's released by the sun, that should tell you how powerful nuclear fusion is. Nuclear power plants, they don't use fusion, they use fission, which we'll talk about in a bit. The reason we can't do fusion yet is because it requires such high temperatures. There's no material known to man yet that can withstand the temperatures required and created by nuclear fusion. So that's kind of the, the goal with nuclear fusion, is to find a way to do it. You'll hear the word cold fusion. What that means is fusion that happens at temperatures that we can withstand, or temperatures that materials on Earth can withstand. And if we can get those, we can use nuclear fusion to power things. So if you look at the byproducts and the ingredients for nuclear fusion, all that goes into it is hydrogen. There's plenty of hydrogen in the world. Uh, deuterium, this guy right here, you can actually find it in seawater. So those two right there, not dangerous uh, reactants. And what's produced? Helium. Okay, so there's no dangerous byproducts here. It's not like the nuclear fission plants we have now where you produce that nuclear rate waste. You have the radioactive starting material and a radioactive ending material. Uh, that's what makes fusion so kind of sketchy. If we can get fusion to work, though, this is a very, very clean, very renewable power source that could last for a very long time. Also thinking about the power released by nuclear fusion, we have done a fusion reaction on Earth, but it was called the hydrogen bomb. So the hydrogen bomb used this concept of combining nuclei to release energy, and in order to generate the heat and pressure required to trigger this reaction right here, they had to use a nuclear bomb. So the fuse for a fusion bomb is a nuclear bomb. So literally, the hydrogen bomb was a nuclear bomb, an atomic bomb with a hydrogen bomb built in it. The atomic bomb goes off, and that triggers the hydrogen bomb. So think about the difference between lighting a fuse and the explosion of TNT. That was the order of magnitude, the difference between the hydrogen bomb and the atomic bombs like we dropped on Japan back in World War II. So huge difference. There was actually some worry when they first lit off the bomb that it would destroy the entire atmosphere. It would be so powerful, and they would essentially annihilate the world. But they lit it off anyway in the name of science. All right, now fission. This is the more common one. This is what they use in nuclear power plants. This is what they used on the atomic bombs that we built. So it's when a mass nuclear, so a very, very large one. We're talking about things like uranium here and plutonium. That's why you hear them in terms of nuclear power and bombs. Uh, so you have those massive nucleuses, and they're split into two smaller nucleuses that are greater than or equal to 56. So they're split into much, much smaller atoms. When this happens, the mass of each nucleon decreases, so you pull them apart, they get a little smaller than they were before. That lost mass, not destroyed, it's converted into energy. So in order to create this fission reaction, what has to happen is to take a neutron, usually, and shoot it into a nucleus, so something like uranium-235. This uranium nucleus, it's unstable and it's radioactive and it will decay, but it might not decay at a fast enough rate or a rate that we really want it to decay at. In order to create these fission reactions, so for power or for a bomb, you want this reaction to be unstable. You want it to happen very, very quickly. So you can't deal with a half-life that's a hundred or a thousand or a million years. So they shoot a neutron, very, very high power, into the nucleus. When that happens, you move it out of the band of stability or farther out of the band of stability. 
and that creates an unstable nucleus. That unstable nucleus then will split apart into two smaller atoms, once again with an uh, atomic number less than 56. So we produce barium and krypton in this case when we do a fission reaction with uranium-235. When this happens, you're releasing a lot of energy because the mass of both of those will decrease, and you're also releasing three other neutrons. So you wouldn't do this with one uranium atom at a time. You would have a block of uranium. And so you would shoot one neutron into that uranium molecule. That uranium molecule would split apart and release three more. Those three can then go on to hit other uranium atoms. And those uranium atoms would do the same thing, release three more. Those would release three more. And you get kind of this chain reaction. So here's uranium-235 again. When this is happening, we don't just have a single uranium atom sitting inside of a bomb or sitting inside of a nuclear reactor. We would have billions, you know, huge grams of it, so that's going to mean moles and moles and Avogadro's numbers worth of uranium atoms. So they would fire in just one or a few neutrons that would hit that guy right there. This guy is going to become unstable, split apart, and release three other neutrons. And so then what happens is it'll keep going. This guy releases its three neutrons, which hits three other uranium atoms. That would hit three other uraniums, and so it's going to keep going up exponentially like that, and you get this huge chain reaction that's triggered by just a, a single piece. Fire that one neutron in there, and you produce a giant chain reaction where it's going to keep going on into infinity. If it or until the uranium runs out. If it's left unchecked, okay, if you just shoot a neutron, you've got a bunch of uranium with nothing to stop those neutrons from hitting the other uraniums, you get a chain reaction, and that would be, in the case of a nuclear bomb, a giant mushroom cloud explosion. In the case of a nuclear power plant, it would be what causes a meltdown. So that means uranium is just going to keep decaying, boom, 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 breaking apart, releasing those neutrons, releasing a ton of energy, and that energy will increase more than the power plant can handle, and it'll cause that meltdown where everything essentially just melts because of the massive amounts of energy that are produced. What the goal is then in a nuclear power plant when they're trying to kind of control this reaction so they don't want a buttload of energy released all at once, they want it kind of slowly released so that they can generate energy from it, they'll have what's called control rods. And so control rods are just inert rods that can absorb neutrons. And so what that would do then, instead of those nine neutrons being created, they could lower that control rod in there and it would capture some of these neutrons and so it would slow down the reaction. And they can lift up and lower those uranium rods or those control rods to absorb neutrons, to slow it down or speed it up, depending on what they need. So the reason massive or larger elements can undergo this fission, they can break apart into smaller nucleus, nuclei, is because of binding energy. So if you think of a very, very large atom, that means a huge circumference versus a small one. And so a larger circumference means more nucleons on the outside. So you're going to have a larger ring of nucleons covering the outside than right here. Less surface area for a smaller one than for a big one. And the nucleons that are on the outside don't have as much binding energy as the inner ones. So if you look at these little red arrows, those red arrows represent binding energy. Take a look at like these two nucleons right here. They only have two places that they're uh, exhibiting binding energy, as opposed to the inner ones that have four places. So these inner ones have more binding energy than these outer ones. So if you create more outer nucleons, you're creating more nucleons that have less binding energy. So what that means is the overall binding energy per nucleon, when you divide the binding energy by the number of nucleons, you create less binding energy because the overall binding energy would be less per nucleon for a larger atom than it is for a smaller atom. So that means these guys can break apart a lot easier to form those smaller atoms. And kind of the magic number where they start, you know, having a decent amount of binding energy per nucleon is at 56. And so that's why they break apart to 56 and smaller. Any nucleus above 56 is going to have a fairly low binding energy per nucleon. I'll take a look at this graph real quick. This just shows the binding energy per nucleon versus the mass number. So we can see as you increase the mass, you also increase the binding energy until it gets up here to the atomic mass. So the elements with 56 nucleons, once it reaches that critical point, it starts going back down again. So that's why elements like 235 can break apart into barium and krypton and increase their binding energy when that happens. 
So these elements on this side of the 56, they will fuse together in order to increase their binding energy. These elements right here will fission, so they'll break apart in order to increase their binding energy. So the goal here then would be to increase stability and increase binding energy for the element. Okay, and keep in mind for fission, that mass that's being lost and converted to energy, it's not a large amount of mass, so it's not like the mass number, the nucleon number, is going to change when it undergoes a fission reaction. So fission reactions must balance just like normal. So let's say that uranium-235, we fire a neutron at it. When that happens, it can break apart into several different things. We saw the barium and krypton, could be cesium and rubidium. It doesn't really matter as long as they balance out. There's many other possible combinations of products. So if we look here, it was 1 plus 235, so 236 was the mass before, and the overall number of protons was 92. If we look over on this side, 130 plus 104 plus 1, that equals 236, which is what we started with. And then over here, 55 plus 37 plus 0, that equals 92, which is also what we started with. So the numbers across the top and the numbers across the bottom have to be equal on both sides for fission reactions as well as fusion reactions or any nuclear decays that we happen to look at.